What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here, and this is the Argos by Odyssey Espresso. Now this just might be the most highly anticipated espresso machine release that I've experienced since starting YouTube about three years ago. I was one of the early backers, but kind of delayed telling them to ship mine out because I didn't really have time to do the review justice until now. So we got it shipped in and here we are. Now before jumping into this, I do wanna say, yes, I paid full price for this, no discount, full shipping, import taxes, all that good stuff in order to get this here. So I've been waiting, I paid just like everyone else, and these are my thoughts. I also wanna say I normally take longer on reviews for machines like this, but this time I only took about a month. Now I did this because I know how many people have been awaiting this review in order to put it, potentially put in an order or to cancel an order or whatever it might be. So what I did is I did about 300 to 350 shots over the past month. I was using this pulling multiple shots a day. Some days I'll do 40 to 60 shots in order to really get a feel for this, doing multiple case measurements, doing multiple different types of coffees and doing multiple different types of extractions. So I kind of crammed three or four months of testing into one month to ensure that I gave you a really solid quality review to my standards, as well as one on a faster timeline for those of you who've been asking for one for so long. So now some of you who may have never seen my channel might be asking, well, what's what's so special about this? What's so interesting? It's, it's a lever. Why would we want a lever over a semi-automatic? Well, if that's your question, then maybe a lever isn't for you, but there is a huge desire in the market for a more affordable lever machine. So there are essentially two types of levers. You have direct levers, which is essentially you're applying force directly with some sort of lever arm, like on the robot, in order to exert the pressure directly onto the pump. Now this gives you complete control over the process because you can go up to like nine bar and then you can slow down to three, go up to four, whatever you wanna do throughout the espresso extraction, which obviously a pump machine does not allow you to do. You're kind of set with whatever the pump tells you, or you spend more money for something that's more computerized and you can have control through software. But there seems to be a growing trend of people moving away from those, even though there are more machines filling that market, and wanting to get into the simplicity of a lever. So you have direct lever, like the Olympia Cremina, like the Streetman machine, like all these other ones. But you also have a spring lever machine, which is essentially what this configuration is currently. There's a spring inside here that controls the piston's power. So you have a spring that's rated to a certain pressure. You compress the spring, water enters the chamber. When you let go of the lever, the spring overtakes and creates the force needed to create your espresso. And so you get kind of a naturally declining pressure profile where you don't have to intervene any longer with your hand. So you kind of have these two camps of lever machines, the direct lever, now with direct levers, you can trace those back to about 1951, 1952 with the creation of the Gaja Gilda, which I have tattooed right there. Or you can go back to 1948, which is when the release of the Spring Group first happened, which was a play on the Criminis Screw Group patent that Achille Gaja bought from the widow of Criminis. So what makes this so special? Is it spring? Is it direct? Is it something different? Well, actually this offers both. So currently I have it in a spring configuration where when I pull down, it compresses a spring in order to give us that naturally declining pressure profile. But I can easily open up this group head, remove the spring and put it all back together to have a direct lever machine. So you have a two in one type of machine right here, but that, isn't all that this machine promised. And that's why there's so much hype around this. Now there is another bifurcation to kind of understand, and that's the difference between an open boiler and a closed boiler. Now the open boiler is open to the element. So it's something that is not pressurized. You can open up the lid, pour water in, think about like the Streetman, or in a way the Flare 58 is because more people are familiar with that. It doesn't actually boil the water for you, though there is a heating element, but imagine there was a boiling coil inside. That would be the idea of an open boiler. So essentially, the the water has to travel down because it's not pressurized in order to shoot water up into a specific cavity. Like the Streetman and like the new lever called the Alm Kopi, which we'll be covering here shortly. And then on the other end, you have closed boilers, which are pressurized. These are ones that have like a really tightly screwed on cap in order to create pressure inside. So think Cremina, think Londinium, think things along those lines where it's pressurizing inside the boiler because it's completely sealed off. And so when it's heating up, the steam pressure can build in order to cater water 
against the forces of gravity into a cavity where it can fill the brew chamber to make your coffee. And this is where you can get that steam pre-infusion. And this can happen on both a direct lever or a spring lever. You can have closed boilers on either one. This machine is actually a closed boiler unit. I tend to prefer closed boiler systems. That's not to say I don't love open boilers as well, but when you look at something like a, the Kermina or a lot of these vintage lever machines that I have and I use, I've really come to love that pressurized pre-infusion from the steam pre-infusion. So that steam pressure just blasting water over the puck prior to taking over control with either direct lever or with that spring. Now, one of the issues with those is thermal management. Whenever you're using a closed system like that, it prioritizes the steam pressure by using a pressure stat. Now, what that means is it is measuring the pressure inside the boiler. And when it gets over a certain pressure, a certain bar, it will turn off the heating coils for a bit to go back down. And there's a range in which it will oscillate. Now, you can imagine what that temperature of the water would be in there by the time it gets to the puck. Obviously, it's over boiling inside the steam boiler itself. But as it travels through your machine, it loses temperature prior to getting to the puck. So there is some sort of temperature surfing that is necessary because there's no good way to really control the heat, especially as you pull multiple shots. Now, this is probably the biggest issue in closed boiler units like a La Pavoni and like these other machines that I've mentioned, is that group head in successive shots gets hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, especially because usually they're made out of like a chrome plated brass or something that can hold that heat really well. Now, because of this, when you pull multiple shots, you can start out with a really nice temperature of maybe 85 or 90 degree water hitting your puck. But as you keep pulling, that water temperature increases in its experience or interaction with the puck and can get up close to 100 degrees if you're not careful because of the heat of that group head itself. So it's because of this issue that Ross was inspired with the thermal management system he created on the Argos. So instead of prioritizing steam pressure, which is what has always been done, there's no real other evidence of something different other than using a P stat in order to fluctuate to really optimize that steam pre-infusion, which does give you consistent pre-infusion pressure with each successive shot, but you have a more difficult time controlling the temperature. Now there are claims of some companies who think that they have figured out how to stop this drifting of temperature in the group head based off of this, that, or the other. I've checked into these claims and honestly with the machines I've used where the claims have been made I still see a massively drifting temperature in the group head. I've yet to see something that has effectively been able to keep constant steam pressure without overheating the group head with successive shots. So you see people taking ice packs and different things like that, cool rags to cool down the group head so that you can continue pulling shots without getting into those rancid flavors from having too hot of water. So that was the, that was the issue that Ross was facing when building this. And he came up with an incredibly elegant solution. It's the first thing, I know we've talked about a lot of things, but th this is for those people who are not very initiated in the lever world and really want to understand what's going on. It's good to have a, a good foundation and to understand how you cannot approach this like a typical lever. You have to reteach yourself. I felt like a newbie when I got this in because it is so different than anything I've had before and I've owned and do own over 20 lever machines. So when you approach this, you kind of need to understand this. So his approach was to not prioritize steam pressure over temperature stability. So instead of having a constant steam pressure of two bar or 1.75 bar or 2.25, whatever it might be, instead of having that oscillating P stat controlling the brew temperature, he decided he was going to allow temperature stability to reign supreme. So what this means is he has thermoprobes, and in fact, you can see one right here coming out of the back of the group head, but he has these temperature sensors in order to measure and follow what the temperature is at throughout the system itself. And then by creating a complex algorithm that he worked with others on, he was able to do an offset type of system where as the group head gets hotter with each successive shot, the steam boiler or the boiler itself is going to get cooler. So it will change the goal or the peak temperature for the PID controller to hit in order to maintain equilibrium with the brew group. So let's say the brew group is at 25 Celsius. That would mean the boiler would need to be at 125 degrees Celsius in order to allow, in order to allow a proper brewing temperature to occur. Now on the machine itself, it allows you to choose between 88 and 96 degrees Celsius. Although I've read 
thread that they may open it up to more temperatures through a firmware update and using the app on your phone. But that is kind of your range in order to control the temperature of your shot. So as this group brew group continues to heat up throughout successive shots, the, the boiler will continue to decrease. Now, as you can imagine, that is going to mess with the pre-infusion pressure. The pressure inside of that chamber is going to decrease as the temperature in it is decreasing. So when it's up at 125 C, because you have a cool brew group, because it's your first shot of the day, well, you're gonna have, you know, two bar of pressure or something along those lines. Then as you pull your first shot, it lets off a lot of that steam. The brew group gets a lot hotter. The PID controller goal is going to change in order to have equilibrium with the new temperature in the brew group itself. So the brew group may go up to 35 degrees. So maybe the steam boiler needs to go down to 114. I'm not sure exactly the numbers, but you're getting the idea. With the lower temperature, there's less steam pressure. And so on your second shot, it may be around one and a half bar of pressure. And then as you go to your third shot, maybe the brew group is at 45 degrees. And so the steam or the boiler goes down to 104. So then you're down to about a bar of pressure and it goes on and on and on. So it's quite an intuitive system. It makes sense that you would want to offset the two. But the question is how effective is it? Now, of course, I grabbed my scase which is this cutie patootie, uh, not a cheap toy, but it's essentially a basket with a hole drilled in the bottom. They have sealed it off so that a very constricted flow rate comes out to emulate the pressure you observe in a, an extraction. You have something to emulate a puck right here and then the thermoprobe right in the middle. What this allows me to do is to hook it up to my fluke thermometer and to measure essentially the temperature of the water coming out in order to kind of verify their claims. Now in their QC protocol, they do perform four consecutive scase measurements at 90 degrees in order to ensure that that it's within their margin of error, which is around one degree Celsius. Now, of course, a lot of companies maintain that they have all these perfect scase readings, blah, blah, blah. Now, myself and multiple others have tested a lot of these conjectures on a lot of these different machines and have found a lot of inconsistency. And of course, you know, a, a manufacturer is going to put out the best numbers possible. And perhaps some units can do it, some can't, or in certain scenarios it can do it. But with this, I sat down with my scase for about one hour and pulled shots, refilled the boiler, pulled shots, refilled the boiler. So I was allowing the group head to in get incredibly hot for what it is. Now this is designed to be a massive heat sink. This is all stainless steel and the idea was for this to be a heat sink, not to heat up rapidly like a brass unit would on an E61 because that's part of the thermal stability. This is to sink out the heat so that you are losing temperature so that the boiler can be at the higher temperature throughout. Of course, it's still gonna heat up because it's steel, but but the idea is for it to do that slowly and to dissipate a lot of that heat. So anyway, I took my scase and I sat there and I measured and I measured and I measured and I measured and I measured. And throughout the whole process, there was only a real deviation of about two degrees Celsius at the worst. Never did it go over the target temperature by two. The worst is it would go below it by about two, but that's within their margin that they quote to customers. In their testing, they only want one degree, but what I've seen online is two degrees Celsius. And it was, it was within that every single, that was a fantastic result. And in fact, over that hour or so of testing, the only big difference that I noticed was not any type of trend of the temperature going up or down or anything like that, but the only difference I noticed from the early shots to about an hour later where the group head was really hot was the difference in aggression of the declination of temperature throughout the shot. What I mean by that is during that a shot with this case, it would lose you know anywhere from 13 to 14 degrees Celsius over the period of the shot, which is very typical which is very typical of lever machines when you have that closed boiler. You lose temperature rapidly, which is actually a very sought after thing because at the end of the extraction, higher temperatures can, can cause more accurate or bitter notes in your coffee. So you have that temperature decrease, which I actually really enjoy. But as you kept going and the group head got hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, the only difference I noticed was less of a temperature drop. So as, which makes sense. So as you got to that 30 minute, 40 minute mark and the group head was reading about 70 degrees Celsius, then you would see maybe only an eight degree drop as opposed to a 13 or 14 degree drop, which honestly, I highly doubt most could tell the difference in cut between those two, but if they could, good on them. But anyway, the idea is that even with all those shots, the group head did not get that hot. You normally see about 80 degrees Celsius is what is used in lever machines on the group head. But this at the hottest was really only reading around 75 Celsius. I'm sure I could have gone hotter, but that no one in their right mind is ever gonna pull more than 20 shots in one go. And that is where I was at to hit that 75 degree marker. 
Now, normal these normal lever machines, some of you might be asking, well, those do 80, why is this so much colder? Well, again, it's because they are prioritizing temperature stability over everything else. And they've also decided to use a heat sink material as opposed to something like brass that can kind of retain that heat and really emanate that heat. This again allows for a more stable system within the machine. So very exciting technology that actually works. For the first time in my experience with lever machines, I don't have to worry about thermal management at all. There's no real preheating necessary. There's no real flushing necessary. It all just works which is a theme for this machine that I'm very excited about. So that is a big thing. We've hit it. Let's go ahead and move on. We don't want to belabor that point, but just know that this prioritizes temperature. So when you're walking up to it and you see the temperature light is on, which we'll show here in a second, then you know and can be confident in the fact that you are going to get right around that set temperature you made, which is on the dial on the side. So talking about these lights, there are three lights on here. You have one on the back, which shows up when you're low on water. You can also see this in the app that's connected to it and we'll look at the app here in a second. The middle one shows you when you are at the proper temperature to pull your shot. And then the bottom one is to show you whenever you have the steam switch on. So on this knob over here, not only does it change temperature of your group head or of, this, of the boiler itself, but when you click it like this, it changes it into a steam mode, which heats up the boiler a lot higher, set to about 130 degrees Celsius. And it will do that in order to build up the pressure necessary for really nice steam. Now the steaming is incredible on this and we'll look at that later. But then when you turn it off, it goes back to its originally set temperature that is based off of the algorithm with the PID controllers kind of talking with each other with the thermoprobes throughout the system. So you might be thinking, well, what about workflow? Well, I would recommend if pulling, you know, two shots for two caps, you pull both shots and then you turn on the steamer and it takes about 30 seconds to heat up and then you steam your milk. If you're doing maybe four shots, maybe you could pull two shots and in the middle of pulling the second shot, go ahead and turn this on. So by the end of the shot, it's up to temperature and then you can steam your milk while you're steaming, turn it back off so it can cool down by the time you pull the next two shots and then repeat. So there are a lot of different ways you can play around with workflow, but the idea is that you can manipulate this in order to work around your workflow, especially when doing milk beverages, extremely granular temperature on your espresso is not nearly as important as when you're pulling straight shots. So there's a lot of different ways that you can play around with it, but just know that there is only one boiler in here. So when you heat it up to 130, well, it's gonna take a while to cool down. Some hacks include bleeding out the steam wand itself in order to lower the temperature inside, but then you're also losing the pressure, yada, yada, yada. So there are some things you can play around with it. And Ross is constantly uploading videos of his workflow on the Odyssey YouTube page. So when looking at the machine, we obviously have the lever right here, which is kind of the stud of it all. So with the eight bar spring inside of this, it takes about 20 pounds of force, or you know, just shy of 10 kilos. And with the six bar spring, it takes about 15 pounds of force, or around seven or so kilograms of force. So it's not that, that much force in order to fully compress the spring. We come down, and of course, we have a very simplistic group head. So just four screws sitting here at the top, and then underneath here, you have a couple of screws holding the group head to the actual frame itself. When we turn the machine back around, you see here a thermoprobe that's going into the group head. And just below it is where you have the entry of the water from the boiler itself. Now coming to the other side, you have the pressure gauge and I have a Bluetooth transducer. Now both the gauge and obviously the transducer are optional. You don't need either one, especially if you're only ever gonna use the spring lever. There's no real point in getting the pressure gauge unless you just really want that data to ensure you're hitting a certain uh, pressure. But in reality, you don't really need these with the spring lever. I would definitely recommend it for a direct lever, both the spring lever, you know, to each their own. But on here, it's held on. It actually doubles up two of the screws on top so that you can just reuse two of the holes already in the machine to mount the pressure gauge. Now back here, I have my Smart Espresso Profiler pill, which is put onto a fitting that I was able to buy from Odyssey that fits inside of their splitter. Then down here is where we're gonna read the water for the pressure. Now this is an, actually an important thing to recognize because after we're done pulling a shot, there's gonna be water here and I'm gonna show you how to rid of that water. Then we move around the machine and we have what I think is a really sophisticated boiler cap. All you have to do in order to release it is turn it 90 degrees and it's locked in there really well by these two lugs, okay? Now on it is actually a pressure gauge. So you're able to see the pressure inside the boiler at all times. And this is actually a very important thing because it will tell you how you should approach pre-infusion. If you have a high pressure around two bar, you can just rely on that steam pre-infusion. But if it's down at a bar or below, you might need to do something like a mini Fellini, which I'll show as we pull a shot here in a little bit. But anyway, it's a very simple screw cap to put on and those lugs with this gasket down below 
remote, keep it firmly in place so you never really have to worry about it. Then as long as you get the pressure down to zero, you can remove it to refill. So refilling is actually super easy. You would think that because it's such a small boiler at 0.6 liters, it would be a headache to keep refilling. This is actually something I wanted to talk about. I actually like that it's such a small boiler. Yes, you do essentially need to refill it daily, but I like that because it forces you to not let water just sit in here stagnant and boil and get cool, boil, get cool, boil, get cool, which can mess with your water content. So when you're having to put fresh water in daily, I think that is a great way to ensure that you're optimizing your espresso experience daily. On top of that, it takes up a lot less energy to heat up. And because of the smaller boiler, you get this really tiny footprint overall. Now to refill it, you might think that might be a pain because it's pressurized, but all I do in order to refill is I just bleed the steam wand, even if there's not much pressure, you just bleed it, it takes a few seconds until the pressure gauge hits zero. Then a 90 degree turn, pop off, refill it. You get a funnel with your Argos, you just put right in there and then you fill. Now this is a nitpick I have. Refilling can be annoying until you get used to it. So essentially, it is very critical to not overfill the boiler. And I don't mean overflow where water's coming out the top. I mean, they recommend you don't fill up past one and a half inch or about three and a half centimeters below the level or below the top of it. So essentially that is filling up to where it's about here inside your funnel. So right when you see water coming in, that's when you need to stop. But as you can imagine, with it being black and it's difficult to get light in there and the hole is so narrow, it's difficult to see when you're there. So you need to get like a flashlight or something over it to really ensure you don't overfill. If you overfill, you could actually hit over three bar of pressure inside and it might need to rely on the anti-vac or the safety system. But on top of all that, you can also get some leakage or some condensation that's going on inside of the machine itself. So it's very, very, very important to not overfill your machine because it can lead to some problematic issues. Nothing that's too devastating unless you do it all the time, but something that is quir uh, quirk nonetheless. But of course, after a certain time, you'll be able to know once the light comes on that you need to refill with water, you can have the a specific maybe pitcher or something where you know the exact amount of water that's needed to fill it up the right time once that light comes on. And as long as you're doing that, you're good to go. Just don't overfill it, which I do think is kind of an annoyance because there's no sight glass on here like on traditional levers. So you don't know where your water level is at. You can't really see how much you're filling up, but you do have this light that comes on and in the app it tells you when your water is low to refill. Anyway, so it's a positive and a negative. I think this will force people to take a bit more care of their water in their machine but also it can it brings it brings forward that potential issue with overfilling that's it with the uh, with the boiler so we're going to put this cap back on and we're going to move on oops let's put it this way now here of course we have our steam one it actually has a really nice ball joint on it that makes it really versatile to go all the way around. Now, I personally have not had any issue steaming milk, and I'm gonna show you an example of that in this video. But there are some people I've read online that have had some difficulties with how fast the steam is coming out. It's quite aggressive, which I actually love. You know, having been a barista, working with high powerful commercial machines, I enjoy fast steam coming out of this. This matches something like the Vectus with a really hardcore steam power. But some have found that they prefer using uh, different tips or I know that my friend Steven Reinhardt, he has actually taken uh, the decent steam, uh, which is a single hole tip, and has replaced it. I know that my friend Caleb Schwartz has taken a La Marzocco GS3 wand and has put it on here because he has found that he prefers that slightly. So there are people who have been modding out the wands, putting different wands on in order to, you know, make their make their experience a bit better. But I, I am just so so in the camp of you can learn on any steam wand, it doesn't matter. I, I find this absolutely satisfactory. So I won't be changing my steam wand and I really like how it folds up right there because I rarely ever use it. In fact, I only really use it for demonstrations. I just am not a milk drink person. But anyway, going on with the steam wand, it's a very simple action. You unscrew right here and then you turn it off going the opposite way. Very simple. And when you order the machine, you can have them mounted on this side or the other side. Now you could switch it at home, but it's a very arduous process that they definitely do not recommend. So once you kind of commit to right or left hand, you kind of just need to be happy with that unless you are incredibly capable with engineering and all this stuff because it would be a full teardown. Now in the future, I did read that they will likely offer a no steam wand option if someone just wants a blank side because they never use milk. And that's something I would actually be interested in. You can make this have an even slimmer kind of profile uh, because I don't really ever steam milk. And if I needed to, well, I have a thousand other machines to do the job. but. That is something I think is quite interesting is they will they will eventually offer that as an option to just have 
nothing there, which is great. Now we get to the other side. As I already showed you, this is where the knob is for the PID controller. So this is where you control the temperature. So you can go all the way down to 88, which is where I'm at. You can go all the way up to 96. Now there are little ticks each side, so you can do it without looking. It feels kind of nice. Now this also is just pressed in in order to turn on the steam. Turn off the steam, on, off, on, off. Once you turn it on, it takes about 30 seconds for it to get to temperature in order to have the adequate pressure to steam your milk. Now this isn't really proprietary because there is another company that makes compatible porta filters, but they had to use slimmer lugs in order to fit with the group head that they were creating. So you can't fit in like the canal porta filter or the unifilter or E61 porta filters, La Marzocco porta filters. You have to essentially use the one that you're shipped with or you can check out that other company that uh, Ross mentions on the different fora in order to check check out you know, different options. But in reality, this does the job and it can fit all the fancy baskets you want. You can turn your own handle, I guess. Now, the one thing I do wish is I really enjoy the porta filters that lay flat. So the fact that none of them available with these types of lugs can do that is a bummer, but it is what it is. That's really not a nitpick because there are a lot of machines that can't fit those types of porta filters. So you get that with a 18 gram basket that comes stock. Oh, got it out, which is similar to, I've seen some people post pictures beside a Pullman 876. I've looked and they are similar. It also is somewhat similar to like a VST or IMS. Uh, when you put it under a microscope, it has similar quality. It's a good basket uh, and it's something that you don't really need to change from unless you want to go to those more high extracting baskets. But it's an 18 gram basket. It fits 18 grams of light roast pretty comfortably. Uh, of dark roast, it would be a bit more of a squeeze, but anyway, uh, it's, it's a nice porta filter. Now underneath, of course, we have the E61 style shower screen. So in order to take it off, you just take a flathead screwdriver and you just pry off the side in order to get it and clean it if you need to. But in reality, the many flushes you do after every pull is gonna be more than enough to clean out that shower screen. But of course, there are gonna be people who wanna pull that out. So it's essentially, you wanna be very careful, maybe even put a little piece of cloth on that so you don't puncture the, the, the screen, but you just put it on the side and you slowly pull it down in order to release that in the gasket. And you can clean it up to put it back up, all good to go. Now next up is a big con for me on this machine and it's this dinky little tray. Now thankfully, I do know that they are going to be fixing this. They have had a lot of negative feedback about this. First off, the sides are really sharp. So one of the first things I did is I sanded down these sides with a little Dremel tool and a little um, a little sanding bit on the end just to make quick, quick work of it. So this turns out to be really sharp. And then there's also no good way to take this out. So they're gonna put a little indent for your finger. Essentially for now you have to flip it, which is fine. But if it's filled with something, you can't really do that. So essentially I go to the sink, I hold it like this. I just let my thumb get dirty and then I'll pull it apart and it's kind of a mess. But it, it, you know, it does the job. It's not ideal, but yeah, it does the job. And then they have, you know, this little magnet on the bottom in order to make sure it sticks pretty nicely. It's not that strong, but it does the job. And then another issue with it is it causes a ton of splatter. So the reason they have it built like this with a big volume inside is because typically with lever machines, if you're at your desired volume, you just pull the cup away as the shot continues to extract and then you let it extract into here. But because of the geometry of this, it hits and splatters and you can get just a ton of splatters all the way around. So when I was pulling these dozens and dozens of shots in one day, I would have just, when I'd move the Odyssey at the end, I just had this big Jackson and Pollock on my table of coffee everywhere. And it's because when you pull the cup away, it just splatters everywhere. Now, of course you can put a scale on top. I like, I use the Akaya Lunar. You can put a scale on top, which might be a little junky because then when you're done, you'd have to pull the scale and the cup away. But a, a nice little trick that Ross shows is you can just put it right below like so. And this allows you to open up for a lot of different types of scales. You don't need to have a lunar or something small. You can put pretty much any scale down there that will fit. And so that is a nice little hack right there. But they will be changing this to something that doesn't splatter as poorly and that has an area for a finger to kind of fit in to pull that out. And all this will be going out with their second shipment that should be happening in the next few months. So now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna turn the machine on and we're gonna check out the app. We're gonna see what it kind of tells us, what all it's capable of doing and what all you can add to it in order to optimize your experience with the data that is available. Of course, you don't need all of this. So if you're watching this and you're overwhelmed, like, oh, that's too much stuff. You don't need that. If you just get a basic spring, the eight bar or the six bar, whatever, you can just pull down and release and you're good to go. 
So the first thing, I open my app, and boom, the, the machine's already connected. But I'll go ahead and go to settings. So normally it'll say connect Argos. You click that, which is right there. It says manage Argos right now. But you'd click that, and you would click on your Argos, which should show up based off of Bluetooth. My scale is connected, which is my lunar right here. And then my transducer, which is right here, is already connected. It's the same thing. You would click connect scale if where it says scale connected. You would choose which scale you want to connect. Same thing with the transducer. So very easy and intuitive to follow along there. Now we can go to metrics. So what we see here is the brew set temperature. So literally, that is what this knob is set at. So if I go down, boom, 88. I just turned it, and it reacts immediately. Now we're going up. Now if you notice on that second circle, it says it's at 57 degrees Celsius, which is the boiler temperature. Now the boiler temperature, the, what is real time is that kind of faint blue-green kind of color. The red is the target temperature that is needed in order to give you equilibrium between the boiler and the group head, which the temperature is shown below, to hit your target temperature. So this sounds complicated, but all the complications done here, you don't have to think about any of this. You set your temperature and you go, I've tested it and it is very accurate. So if you notice this red on the boiler temp, it's going to go down as I decrease my desired temperature because it's saying, oh, we don't need as much temperature here to hit 88 degrees with brew water since the group head is at 30 degrees Celsius. But as I increase it to 96, it goes, oh no, we need hotter water. And so it does it. So we're going to put it down to, oh, we'll go to 90 for funsies. And then fluid level, it just says either good or low. So whenever it turns red and shows low, you need to refill it. So just kind of memorize how much volume of water you need. Use the same thing every time. You won't have to worry about uh, overflowing. So then we go over to brew. And immediately it teared my scale. But we go to brew, and we can see a graph that's ready to go. So it shows you time, weight, brew ratio, and flow rate. I have noticed that the flow rate has not been super accurate uh, for me on this. It, it shows usually under a gram a second, which is not accurate for parts of the flow. But anyway, you have uh, all of that, and it'll graph the pressure as well as the weight as you're going through it. So I'm going to set my dosage, which they have three presets. I'm going to do 18 because that is what we'll be setting. So I'm doing an 18 gram dose and it shows, boom, right there, 18 grams. And that way we can keep our data logged and once we're done, we can label it with the coffee we're using or something along those lines. Now let's go back to metrics and we are currently at 93 boiler temps, so we're almost there. I have timed this machine and with cold water that's in my refrigerator, using my zero water pitcher, which I keep in the refrigerator, it takes seven and a half minutes to reach its readiness at 96 degrees Celsius. So probably about seven minutes if you have a lower temperature. Now for using room temperature water, it takes about five or five and a half minutes. In fact, I've seen Ross pulling shots in under that time with room temperature water, or if it's lightly warmed, if you had it in a kettle and then you're wanting to put it in the espresso machine, it'll take even less time, obviously. The starting temperature of the water has a massive effect on how long it takes to get to temperature. So the way it's working is with that PID controller, as it's approaching the temperature, it starts cycling on and off the boiler in order to hit the max temperature or the set temperature as quickly and efficiently as possible without overshooting. That was a big thing they wanted to abstain from is overshooting. So there are different ways you can control the PID where it's, where the damping is like this before it gets to it where it overshoots, undershoots, overshoots, undershoots, and it gets closer and closer. You have a slow ramp and then a critical ramp. And so what they're doing is trying to get it to the max temperature or to that set temperature as quickly as possible by doing very precise cycles of the boiler coil in order to hit that temperature. So now we're at temp already. So since I turned it on, and I've been talking this whole time, we are now at temp. So I'm gonna load up a shot, we're gonna pull it, and we're gonna graph it on my app. Now, it should be noted before continuing that as we sit here, if you start it up and you let it sit, the group head, since it's connected to the boiler, there is a plate connected to the boiler, it is going to continue to heat up. So it started at 30, it's at 32 now, and it will continue to heat up. As that happens, the pressure in the boiler will drop. Why is that? Well, it's because the group head's heating up, so the required temperature in the boiler goes down and down and down and down. So the longer you have it sitting on, the lower the pressure is going to be in the boiler. So if you like high pressure pre-infusions, you should pull it immediately when it's at temp. So we're gonna quickly do that so you can see what a high pressure pre-infusion looks like. Hmm. 
All right, while pulling the shot, what is extremely, extremely important is to understand there is an air bleeding valve inside of the piston. So what that means is we're actually able to effectively remove all of the air inside it, which I'll explain more here in a little bit. But what that means is when the pressure is at its highest, you want to slowly pull the lever down, or if doing a direct, slowly pull it up until you hear air coming out. The reason you want to slowly do it is because water will want to enter the chamber. If you let too much enter, you can kind of ruin the chance to rid all of the air prior to continuing with the shot being filled. As the pressure of the boiler decreases though, you can go straight all the way down and it will still have enough time to release that air because the water won't be entering the chamber as quickly with a lower pressure in the boiler. But anyway, let's go ahead and click start on our brew and here we go. If we listen closely. All right, so we released all the air. Now I'm going all the way down for that pre-infusion. So I'm holding it here until I get about five grams in the cup, and then I'm going to release it. So that initial part is critical in order to allow us to use the full volume of the chamber. If there was air in it, we wouldn't have the, we wouldn't be able to use the full volume of that chamber because we'd have air as part of the volume. But here we go. And the pressure spikes right around eight bar of pressure. So it's just at eight bar of pressure. So eight bar spring, it's hitting eight bar of pressure. Now you may be wondering, well, in the Vectus video, you showed the eight and a half bar spring was only hitting six and a half bar of pressure. And that's because there is no way, at least in any lever machine I know, to bleed the air during the shot. So with the Vectus, you weren't bleeding air before every shot. So what I was showing with that pressure reading, and here we are, we're at 41 grams of espresso out. But in that Vectus video, I was showing the observed pressure that you were getting on your puck, which even though it was an eight and a half bar spring, you were only really getting about six to six and a half bar, depending on the grind setting that you were using for your coffee. And that's because there is that bit of air above the puck that's acting as kind of a sponge and it's not giving you the full force of that pressure. Same thing would happen here, but they have an air bleed valve inside that piston. So when you go down, it's allowing the air to bleed out so that you have more room to fill with volume of water. If I were to immediately go all the way down, first off, I wouldn't be able to peak at eight bar. Second off, I wouldn't be able to get 40 grams of yield, which would be kind of a bummer. So anyway, let's go ahead and taste this bad boy. I didn't stop my graphing. Whoops. That is a fantastically balanced shot. Very syrupy. Clean, 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 very balanced. This is like a medium lightly roasted coffee. It's a blend. And it's very nice. Woo. So that's kind of what we have going on with just what a shot looks like. You go down, you bleed, then you finish it all the way down. You allow pre-infusion to do its thing. I let the bed get fully saturated at about two bar or one and a half bar, one bar of pressure, which is where the boiler was at. Now, if we go back to metrics, we're gonna see the group head temperature is now at 46 after that long shot. After all that hot water was being exposed to the group head, obviously the temperature was rising up. So now we see the boiler temp target is 109 degrees Celsius. So the pressure has plummeted and we are now down to about mm, 0.95 bar of pressure in the boiler. So now, of course, if when I pre-infuse, it's not going to give me that same amount of saturation that this one and a half bar or so of pressure was able to give me. Instead, I'm gonna have to do what's called a mini Fellini, which I'll show on this next shot. Now you may be asking, well, 40 grams, 42 grams at best, that's not that much output. And no, it isn't, it's not ideal. But it, because of that air bleeding valve, it opens up the potential for a proper Fellini without the fear of unseating the pup. Now, what is a Fellini pull? What does that mean? Well, if you look at this clip here from an old Federico Fellini film, in the background, you see a barista who pulls down and pulls down again to introduce even more water into the system for a bigger yield. Now, this has been seen by enthusiasts around the world and it became to be known as a Fellini move. Fellini was known for getting actual blue collar workers to work as extras in his films. So that was actually a barista and that is actually his workflow. So as you see, it's a pull and then a pull in order to increase that volume and it helps with that saturation phase to give a little bit of extra pressure there. Now people do these on La Pavonis and other things, but it can cause the puck to hop inside of the basket. Now you might be saying, well, prove that Lance. Well, here's a little clip from a video that was done about 10 years ago with a transparent basket showing what can happen with a Fellini pull on something that doesn't have like an air bleeding valve, which is a hop of or an unseating of the puck. Once that happens, 
you'll get water rushing around the edges because that seal around the basket has been broken. And I've shown this actually in a previous video where when you turn off of a pump machine and a solenoid's enacted, and then you run water back through it, you get an incredibly high flow rate because all that water is just escaping around the edges. But if you don't enact the solenoid, you stop flow rate without depressurizing the system, you're able to get a good flow rate without it, without it going around the edges because you never unseated the puck, you never unsealed the puck. Same thing goes on here. Because there is that air valve, you're able to do a Fellini pull and reintroduce water into the chamber without unseating the puck, which gives you essentially an unlimited yield. The only issue is it takes a little while for that water to fill. So a lot of people may be uncomfortable in the middle of a shot, pulling back down, letting it fill, and then continuing. You'll have a three second gap or so in the middle of your shot. Now, I'll be honest, I have not noticed a sensory difference in this. It has been pulling so well, pucks are looking so beautiful, there's no cracks, no anything like that, even though I don't really buy into puckology, it does a great job, and for me, taste is such a big thing. And so for me, when I do Fellini's to, uh, to bring that yield higher to 50, 60 grams, it's not really affecting the taste in a negative way. It might affect texture a little bit because you're letting that puck sit there and dry out, but it's not affecting the flavor for me in any way. That being said, if you're chasing texture, you're not likely not pulling over a 40 gram shot anyway. You're better off doing ristrettos or one to two shots, which you can easily do with one full pull after a pre-infusion of about five grams. But anyway, I'm gonna show you what a mini Fellini looks like to artificially, or kind of, it's not artificial because it's real, but to kind of artificially do a pre-infusion. You're not using the steam pressure though, you're just gonna use hand, uh, you're gonna be using spring pressure. So let's go ahead, reset, and we'll pull another shot. Now, it's important in between shots to, to do this. I'm about to show you an easy practice that you should employ if you get this machine. Because it is still uh, slightly pressurized in the system, you pull down the lever just a bit to or kind of equalize the pressure, and then you pull out that portafilter, okay? Now watch, when I let go, water is going to come out. I have not gone down nearly far enough to introduce new water. This is water still in the system after that uh, extraction. You may be saying, well, that's water waste. Well, no, when you think about it, if you're using a flare, no one is measuring out the exact amount they're using, and they always waste water at the end. This overall wastes about 15 grams of water, but it also is cleaning out your screen and it's purging out the system, getting ready for the next one. But here we go anyway. So I have my basket there to catch it. Here we go. There's some water. Then you go down a little bit, you get some more out, go down a little bit, get some more out, and then you kind of just do this right here to get rid of all of it. And as I said earlier, there was gonna be water caught in this pressure gauge, which is, is necessary because it has to go up in order to give off the pressure reading. And then some others just inside the system itself. So you do this, it cleans out your it cleans out your screen, it gets rid of that water and it primes you for the next shot. The idea is you want this completely dry before continuing. So that's a nice little hack that Ross shows on a video in order to clean out everything inside of there and something that you should definitely employ. But anyway, let's go ahead and get to our next shot. Now, some people will tell you to kind of pull the lever down a bit before locking in the portafilter to remove some of that heads, that air headspace, which can work, but there are also some issues with doing that that if people have shown on different fora. But anyway, with this, it's as simple as bleeding out that air. Now that we're below one bar though, we don't need to do the trick where we go down slowly and listen for the air to escape. The pressure is down enough that we can just go all the way down. Our group head temp is at 47. As I said, it'll sit there and get higher and higher as you just sit and allow contact with the boiler to that boiler plate. But anyway, let's go and pull a shot and I'll show you what to do in order to get that pre-infusion. You'll notice as I pull down, drips won't really come out because, well, there's not enough pre-infusion pressure. So we're going to artificially give it by letting go gently of the handle until we build up, you know, that two bar pressure or so in order to get that five grams of drips out. Then we're just going to bring it all the way back down. We're going to listen for the water to refill completely so we have a full shot. Now, when we have that pressure pre-infusion, we don't have to worry about refilling with that mini Fellini because we're not wasting the water in the chamber when it's that pre-infusion. We're able to keep it at the bottom and that water's being forced through the puck without wasting the water in our chamber because we haven't cut the chamber off. So anyway, here we go. We're gonna pull down. I'm gonna start my brew. So we pull down and we hear the water escaping and the chamber's filling up. And there we go. And I'm gonna lift it. I'm gonna let it get to a couple bar. I'll let it go a little higher than I meant. No big deal. We're going to let it go to about five grams. And then once we get to around five grams, 
I will push back down and we'll listen for the water to refill the chamber once more. Grind size is a little tight here. But here we go. And then listen. We refilled with that water. And now I can just gently let go and let it go up to our, uh, to our weight. To our weight. Now, as you saw, the this, the machine did tip forward a little bit, and if you're not careful, that can happen. They, uh, you know, Ross recommends to push into the machine because there is some friction down here, some rubber pieces that can allow you to do uh, that. That can allow you to push into the machine, and you won't have that tipping issue. Now, pulling from an angle, it's a little difficult to have really nice skills, so I apologize for that. Now, there is something to be mentioned. There can be varying outputs depending on how much pressure is in that system. So right now, my shot pull, did not pull at 41. I was only able to get about right at 37 grams. So a few grams lower than what was previously pulled. Now that can be, maybe I didn't allow that chamber to fully fill after I did that mini Fellini, or maybe I didn't allow, maybe I let more of that pre-infusion uh, with the earlier pull due to that pre-infusion from steam pressure. But in reality, you should be able to get very similar out pulls if you're not shooting for the highest maximum with a single pull every time. But now we're at 38.8, 39 as it's still dropping due to some of that pressure built up. So we'll stop it at 39. I'm going to pull this down just a bit just to show you this trick again. We're going to remove the portafilter, just like so, and then we allow that water to go into the basket. We go down, and there we are, just like so. And that's what we want it to sound like. Boom. All right, so that is how we pull those shots. Uh. So that is how we pull those shots. That's back-to-back -back shots. Obviously, I was going a lot more slowly than I could have. Now the group head temp is up to 54. Boiler temp is at 104. And so the boiler temp keeps dropping. So the pressure keeps dropping, which is going to force these type of mini Fellinis. Now, if you're wanting to do an even bigger shot, you can easily pull with a Fellini mid shot. So I'm going to pull another shot, and I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Let me get another shot loaded up. We'll do one more. So now we're gonna go for a 60 gram yield just to be kind of crazy. And you're gonna see what the pressure looks like and it might freak you out. But again, because of that valve inside, we're able to continually Fellini without worrying about the puck's integrity being threatened. So if you have a really lightly roasted coffee and you want a massive yield, a one to three, a one to four, feel free to just sit there and eat with Fellinis. A big red herring is that of pressure of, or staying at constant pressure, whatever it might be. There is no magical, it needs to be at flat seven bar, flat nine bar, whatever it is. That is largely, like I said, red herring. So anyway, let's go ahead. I'm going to show you how to pull this. And uh, here we go. So we're going to start. I'm going to go down all of the way. We're filling the chamber. Whoops. Filling the chamber. I'm just going to slowly go up. Let it get to about five grams. I'm letting it sit right about where that, that steam pressure would be. So about one and a half bar. So here we go. Just letting drippies come out. And then here in a bit, we're gonna do a Fellini, the mini Fellini. So here we go, we're going down and listen. Refilling with water, and then we go. Now what I'm gonna do is at 20 grams, I'm gonna do another Fellini. So here, we're doing another Fellini right there. So it'll, you'll get about 30 grams in a pull. So if you wanna get up to 60, I'm gonna do another Fellini at 40, right here. And there we are. And as you can see, the stream's still looking really nice. We have really good puck integrity. It's not going too fast, which is showing us that we're good to go. All right. And here we are. We're at 60, so I'm going to go ahead and remove that. So there we have a 60-gram shot. Let me go ahead and turn this off. And yeah, so I did I did a mini Fellini and two full Fellinis in order to hit that 60 gram shot. Yes, it's a bit of an art, it's a bit of an art whenever you're wanting to get bigger yields, but I think that's part of the fun of it is being able to follow and understand when you're wanting to reintroduce that pressure and when you're wanting to elongate that shot when you want to have those pauses and things like that. But that opens up a completely different profile to the coffee than I had before. We've sacrificed texture, but we've really increased the brightness 
as well as the complexity of this coffee. And it's much more drinkable, honestly, because that TDS, the total dissolved solids, the concentration is down quite a bit. But then again, we're gonna pull down, we're gonna pull this out, and bing. Now, of course, if we had full pressure inside of the boiler so that we did not have to do a mini Fellini to recreate that pre-infusion pressure, we probably could have gotten away with doing the pre-infusion, waiting until about 30 grams, then doing one more Fellini, and then having a 60 gram shot with just doing a mini Fellini and a full Fellini. But because we had to do a mini Fellini and we show that that does tend to have a little bit less yield, I did two full Fellinis throughout. Now, I know that's a lot of throwing around the great Italian director's name, but hopefully it was understandable because now we've seen what the Fellini is, you kind of have a better understanding. Now, something else that is very interesting is they recently added a flow restrictor valve right here. Right here. So in that input of water from the boiler into the group head, there is now a little flow restrictor valve that they sent out to people who had some of the original batches and they were able to put it in. Now this is so you do not have to be as careful when you're bleeding the air at the beginning. So mine already has one put in there. So what that means is water is entering, but it's slowing down before it's filling up the chamber, which allows more time for you to be able to bleed all of that air out so that you can take full advantage of both the pressure as well as the volume inside. Now, now, this is a good thing for people who are not used to pulling down and, and waiting on that air to escape before continuing with their shot. But I actually see it, for me, I kind of wish it maybe wasn't there. And that is because it is slowing down greatly the water debit whenever you pull down that lever, when it's at full pressure even, because it's having to go through a restrictor and it's slowing down my Fellini pulls. So as you heard, it took about three seconds for that water to refill the chamber. If that flow restrictor wasn't there, I could pull down and boom, it would refill the chamber faster than I could pull essentially. So I'm, I might just pull out the flow restrictor for my personal use, but I do think for the majority of you, that is a great piece to have in there. Now to remove it, it's very simple. You obviously need to turn the machine off. You need to unscrew the group head to move it a bit. Then you pull this part out and it's just right inside of there. It's very easy and Ross has a video online on their YouTube of how to place in the flow restrictor. So to, to pull it out, you just do the opposite, right? So anyway, we still have that same amount of water I put in at the beginning, which was at the proper fill level. And I was able to pull all those shots, even a 60 gram shot, and there's still more water to go in there. We have not yet hit that low water value. We're still good. The group head temp is now at 57. So obviously as it sits there, it will continue to get hotter and hotter. Now to see how the steam boiler works, I'm gonna go ahead and just flip it on and you're gonna see how quickly that goes. So you see immediately on that screen recording, you see that the red has increased greatly because now it's not worried about the brew group temperature. It's not worried about that. It's worried about getting the steam temperature up. It's worried about getting the pressure up to a capable pressure for steaming. So it's gonna do that as quickly as it can. All right, so once it's at full temperature, which we're pretty much there at, we're 125 degrees Celsius. Once we're at full temp, I'm gonna steam milk and just pour into this espresso we have sitting here. Not great crema, so it may not be a good pour, but just to show you how to steam milk on here. Now, if you think about it, what I would do if, if I wanted to waste more shots is I could pull two shots in a row with a full tank of water, two shots, and then on the second shot, mid shot, I could start the steam boiler so it starts heating up. It's not gonna affect the water in the group head because that's already been sectioned off. So once, once you've pulled that lever down and you've taken the water out of the boiler and you've started your shot, you can start the steam one, no problem. So then it'll heat up as that second shot's pulling, you prep your milk and then you can steam and boom, you've got uh, two, two milks, you can milk share. I really like milk sharing. I've made a video in the past on how to milk share. But anyway, once this gets that temp, though, when we're there, we're gonna steam up some of this good, good milk and we'll pour a little drink. Now for steaming, of course, we're gonna do the same thing that I always teach, halfway and a quarter. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Any steam wand can do that, except for the, the Panarellos. Now I'm gonna take the steam wand, I'm gonna put it in, I'm gonna find my halfway and a quarter. I'm gonna start it up. And then we're just letting it whirl. If you're curious about milk steaming, I've got many videos on it. You can go check those out. We're not gonna, we're not gonna sit here and uh, reteach that. It's the same principles I always use. Once done, always wipe and clear out the wand. Then we're just gonna turn that steam wand off. I could have turned it off earlier, but no big deal. 
All right, so as you can see, there's no creme on this because I pulled such a big shot and it's been sitting here. So don't expect any magic, but we'll, we'll still pour a little something. First pour I've done in a hot minute. Yeah, I've seen worse. For almost no creme, I'll take it. So it does a great job on steaming as long as you hit that proper pressure. Of course, you can switch out the steam wand or the steam tip if you're really inclined to do so. But like I said, I don't really think that's an issue. I think you can figure it out. I mean, I poured that with absolutely no crema at all. And crema is, as I've talked about many times in the past, like the top thing to get good latte art. And I'm still able to get something decent. And that was a one and done. Okay. All right, let's move on. I might be wondering, what is the taste like on this? Is it, is it good? Like, how does it compare to other machines? Well, considering I've owned only one other 58 millimeter spring lever machine, I can say confidently that this tastes better to me. Um, now that might be because of the temperature accuracy. It might be because of the air bleeding and allowing me to hit the full eight bar or something along those lines. I can't really say what it is, but what I can say is it gives me more body, even on lighter roasted coffees, that is much more pleasant, more tactile, I should say, a more pleasing tactile experience, more hits at balance, and it's it's half the price of the other 58 that I own. Now, when it comes to 54 millimeters and those other sizes, it's, it's impossible to do a direct comparison because that group head diameter is such a massive dictator of taste in the cup. You have to go much finer when it's 58 millimeters. You have a more thin puck. You have a lot of different things. Now, I really enjoy the 54 millimeter baskets. I like the deeper puck, not necessarily to get more texture, though it does allow for that, but more so it allows me to grind more coarsely than this counterpart at, at a wider diameter and more shallow puck. So I really like 54, but there's a massive appeal in the market for 58 millimeters, like with the Flare 58. So this really is doing something that no one's doing. It's giving us PID controlled thermal consistent system where you can do either direct or spring. You can track all the data with add-ons. These are not free. These do not come with the machine. You have to add them on. So it's not that cheap once you add everything on, but at a base price of $1,100 US dollars, that is a really hard thing to beat, especially because you automatically get the direct lever configuration. It's the spring lever. You just essentially take the spring out. So I have two of the other springs here. I think they now are only offering eight and six bar springs, but for a bit they had a seven bar spring, so I also got one of those. So I have a six bar, seven bar, and eight bar in here. Now when you bleed the air, you essentially get the, rate, the rating of what these springs are capable of producing. I found I can get eight bar more consistently with the eight bar spring than I can get seven or six with the seven and six, but they're very close, and honestly, you're not really looking to maximize the pressure when you're using lower pressure springs anyway. Why don't they put a nine bar or 10 bar in here? Well, those get so big that it would change the price and it would change the size of the group. So to maintain the size, they had to use a smaller spring, which is absolutely understandable. And at eight bar, I think you're getting great shots anyway, especially if you wanna do the more traditional stuff. So you can change these out quite easily. And again, there are videos on the Odyssey page showing you how to do that. I really enjoy the six bar, the seven bar. I mean, it's really difficult once you do six, seven, eight. I mean, they're so close, but I really like the six bar and it's probably something if I were in a big mood for only light roast, or if I use this for only lightly roasted coffees, I'd probably put the six bar in and do a lot more incredibly fast shots, 10, 15 second shots. But whenever I'm doing these videos, I know that the majority of my audience are not doing the super lightly roasted coffee. So I tested mostly with eight bar, but I can say with confidence, the six bar is absolutely incredible as well. And it can do a lot of the modern style shots that the decent can do. But with this, whether you wanna do direct lever or mess around with springs and Fellinis. All right, and we're back and we have it disassembled because I was gonna pull out that little flow restrictor that I was talking about. So you have this little guy, which covers the orifice. I mean, it's teeny tiny. You can look at it more in depth on Ross's uh, uh, page. And then we have a little spring inside. So we're gonna just put it back to what it was at stock with the first batch of saw, which just has this with a little spring inside to help um, the water get into the chamber. I'll reassemble it all, and then we'll pull another shot and we'll look at how that Fellini is affected by the lack a flow restrictor, which is funny because this was an improvement, but I kind of prefer a higher water debit and I would rather just rely on my own ability to get out that air prior to going on uh, in order to get that higher water debit. So now I've taken out the valve restrictor, so we're gonna be able to see what it's like to pull it with that full flow. I did go a tick finer because it's gonna need that, but this means I will need to be a little bit more careful on that air bleeding portion because the water's gonna be entering the chamber at a much faster pace. So let's go ahead and start the shot. So I'm gonna go down.
letting that air bleed. There we go. But now you have a lot faster fill. That pre-infusion's coming through. I went finer so we're not seeing drops yet. But that boiler pressure is at a bar. So here with some drops. But what you'll see is the Fellini will be a lot faster because I won't need to wait for that the restriction to allow the water to fill that chamber. So we're going to let this come through. And then at 15 grams, I'm going to do the Fellini. So we're at 15. So here we go. And it's already full. So you see how much faster that goes than the other one. We'll do one more. We'll do it at about, I don't know, 35 grams just for funsies. Yeah, we'll do a 40 so we can get a huge shot. And here you go, already full. So whenever you take out that flow restrictor, you're able to have a lot, a lot faster Fellini pulls because that water chamber is gonna be filled so much more quickly. But it also means if you take that out, you'll need to be a lot more careful on bleeding the air. You won't effectively do it if you go all the way down too quickly or if you skip it and let the water come in because it will fill too quickly. You won't be able to get the proper uh, we're at 70 grams. Look at that. You can get big shots with the Fellini. I mean, it's 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 unlimited. You're just continuously filling in that brew chamber. But anyway, let's see if this tastes good. A little bitter, but it was just for demonstration. So that's what that would look like. You'll have a lot faster pre-infusion flow rate. I mean, we're still at a bar of pressure, so I'll kind of just show you. Obviously, I didn't get rid of the that excess water that was in there. But this is what a bar, uh, right around a bar, looks like. So much faster pre-infusion. And obviously if it's up at two bar, it'll be even faster because that steam is gonna be pumping that water through at a faster rate. So that was actually just below a bar. So whenever you have that two, two and a half bar uh, built up inside the tank, once this is a cold group head, you're gonna have a much faster fill rate without that flow restrictor. But again, that's a much more advanced kind of thing. If you're comfortable with it, you can remove it or you can just keep it in there. Uh, I, I just really like faster Fellinis and a faster fill rate. But anyway, that's about everything I wanted to show. I didn't go with the direct lever here because this is all heated up. I, in the regular review, I didn't do the direct either just because I mean, you know how direct lever works and this works like a direct lever once you do it. You might get a couple of grams extra of water because it seems like there's a little bit more movement of the piston. But other than that, it's like you're using a flare or anything else. You just have a direct lever just with the added advantage of a closed boiler system, steam pre-infusion, or you can do the Fellini infusion. And that's about it. So I thank you for following along with this much longer version of the review. I hope that it was insightful, that it was helpful. And if you enjoy this type of me breaking down reviews, let me know down below. If then, you know, hit subscribe on this channel as well. It's really helpful. You can check out my Patreon, different things. If you want to be a part of competitions where we do kind of, you know, giving away some of the stuff that I buy here through these competitions that we host on that Patreon. I have a Discord connected. You can check that out as well as my Instagram. But anyway, I hope that you brew something tasty today. And cheers.